May I please introduce you to Professor Julie Reed. And congratulations, by the way. <laughs> and Julie's been here with the University of Sussex uh, on since 2000 and did a PhD in natural languages. And now she's going to be talking to us about chat GBT. She's got something on the slides to introduce herself, so I won't say too much to steal the thunder from her. Julie. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Yes, so I'm going to be talking about whether we can um, trust um, chat uh, GPT. I'm going to start with a big spoiler, which is the answer to no. Uh, that's the short answer. Um, obviously, if that's all you wanted to know, you want to leave, fine. Um, hopefully, over the next hour, um, I will kind of convince you of why I think that. and. Um, also, why I think actually a large language model such as ChatGPT are still very interesting, even though uh, they're not to be completely trusted um, to tell us the truth the whole time. Overview of the talk. Um, I'm going to start by just saying a little bit about myself, um, so you know whether you can trust me or not, where I've got my information from. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about the hype behind um, generative um, large language models, and um, move on. Uh, to talking about the reality in terms of what we might expect when we're having a conversation with ChatGPT, and just a few illustrative examples I'm um, really there, uh, before going through a kind of brief history of language modelling, um, quite focusing on the, the parts which I think are kind of most pertinent to kind of where we are today um, with these generative large language models. Um, then uh, moving on to um, how generative large language models actually work. Um, I'll give you a kind of overview of that. I won't go into all of the, the kind of details, but hopefully enough to kind of um, illustrate how they work. Throughout that, I will be thinking about the kind of strengths and weaknesses and pitfalls as we go along, but I will kind of summarise some of that at the end. And it'll be a little bit about current work uh, going on here at Sussex and, and the future. Um, so first of all, um, who am I? Well, I am, um, as she introduced me, um, Professor Judy Weed, recently appointed um, this year. Going back uh, before that, I have been here, um, came here first in 2000 um, to do my um, DPhil in natural language processing, and previously done a master's in computer speech and language processing at Cambridge. So I suppose I really started in this field around 1999. Um, and um, so that's kind of, I suppose, where, um, you know, my, my history. Um, and I want to sort of speak a little bit about where kind of natural language processing was circa 2000, which is when I kind of really entered the field. Um, the late 1990s had seen kind of NLP researchers getting really excited about statistical methods using large corpora. A large corpora corpus at the time was something like the British National Corpus, which was absolutely huge in 2000, or we thought it was anyway, at uh, 100 million words. It, it did seem very large and it kind of opened up all of these possibilities and, and potentially some of the possibilities that we are still kind of exploiting today. Now we've got even, even much, um, you know, far larger uh, corpora that our models um, are trained on. I came to Sussex um, to study something called the, the prepositional phrase attachment problem, which is something you've probably never heard of before. So I will kind of just mention briefly uh, what that is. Um, taking these two sentences I've got on the screen here, I saw the man with the gun, and I shot the man with the gun. The task is to decide whether with the gun, which is the prepositional phrase here, attaches to the man, um, in the sense that it is the man who has got the gun, um, and that is what we would expect in this first example because we can't really use a gun to, in the action of seeing something, but when you have a sentence such as I shot the man with the gun, the with the gun can attach to the man, it could be that the man has the gun, or it could attach to the verb shot because it, I could be using the gun to do the shooting of the man. Um, and you know, this was a kind of interesting problem. Um, and what we can kind of see from these examples is that there's nothing really about the kind of the grammar that kind of says it has to be one or the other. You know, it is ambiguous. And which interpretation 
um, should be kind of used kind of depends a lot on the semantics of the words that we, that we see here. And the fact that you know, the differences in meaning between the verb saw and the verb shot kind of tell us which is the most likely interpretation. And these kind of ideas around sort of how semantics and the semantics of words kind of actually influence how language, you know, can different parts connect to each other within a sentence, how we can actually understand um, the, the uh, sentence or utterance. Um, that idea around that we need to kind of think about the, the semantics of words it's connected to another thing that I actually then got really distracted by while I was doing my PhD and was actually what my PhD ended up on, uh, rather than prepositional phrase attachment. I abandoned that to kind of look at this thing which was just getting, wow, say just getting going, although it really went back to the 1950s with Zelig Harris, but in a computational sense it just got going um, around 2000 based on this idea that words that occur in the same context tend to have similar meanings. This was an idea that linguists have been talking about since the 1950s, um, but it was really the, the kind of increases in computing power that we saw in the 90s that allowed us to start applying these ideas to um, large corpora, such as the BMC, 100 million words, it's very exciting as it was at the time, um, to be able to kind of quantify the contexts of a word and to be able to see which words were similar to each other words based on their context. In this example here, if both the words saw and shot can occur in the same context here, and that's telling us something about the fact that they do have similarities in meaning. They're both verbs, they're both things that I can do, they're both things that can be done to a man. Um, but obviously there are differences in meaning and that will become apparent as we look at more and more of the contexts that each of these words um, <coughs> occur. And this is an idea I am going to come back to throughout the talk. It's actually this idea of, from linguistics, the distribution of semantics, actually underpins a lot of what we do in kind of modern um, language modelling. So, before I kind of really explain all of that, I'm going to fast forward to where we are now, which is 2023, uh, where there's a lot of hype around these conversational tools that will allow us to get instant answers and be more creative. So, you know, we've um, all, all, probably everybody has tried out or at least heard of ChatGPT. Um, the one that's kind of really makes the news um, in terms of uh, pr promising us to, to just be able to do everything. You won't need people um, to do anything anymore. Um, I, th I think it was a colleague was telling me earlier today about a school that was proposing to um, introduce ChatGPT as their assistant head teacher. Um, and all of the things that we can do um, with ChatGPT now. And of course, it's really there's a lot of potential for business because they see ways in which they can be more efficient and save costs, can scale things up, can personalise support because we can just ask ChatGPT, we can get ChatGPT to, to write something for us, to correct something for us, to come up with some ideas for us, um, to answer questions for us or answer questions for somebody else so if we're customer support. Um, and um, the questions are coming in from our customers. Well, maybe ChatGPT could answer those questions rather than having to pay somebody um, to answer um, those questions. Other things we can do with ChatGPT, which I got from makeuseof.com, some of which seem kind of, well, I can certainly say I, I know, uh, uh, you know uh, how you know, students may use um, the uh, ChatGPT to help with my essays or explain complex topics. A bit more worried about getting relationship advice and things like that from ChatGPT, but you know, it's one of the things that uh, people are suggesting uh, that we might be able to do um, with ChatGPT. So there's a lot of you know hype around this in terms of all of the things that we can possibly um, do um, with ChatGPT um, and other large language models. 
But does it really work? If we ask it to explain a complex topic, or we ask it to write an essay for us, or we ask it for relationship advice, is it going to give us the right answer? Um, so, just to sort of think through a few examples, I thought, well, I'll just go to ChatGPT and I'll ask it a few things and see what it says and see whether it tells me the right answer. So, my little bit of research for today started around, okay, I'm going to ask it, um, try to find out about the paintings of William Turner. I'll compare that with information that's publicly available on Wikipedia, very trustable, trusty site, and other internet sites uh, where you know we might get um, information um, before ChatGPT. Um, so here, kind of got information um, about uh, Turner um, from the, the Wikipedia um, site. And my conversation with ChatGPT started and asking it about a painting that I've seen on the, the Wikipedia site, asking it when it had been painted, um, and when it was turned board, and everything seemed to stack up and start with. I then decided, well, I think what happens if I ask it about a painting I, I don't actually know about? It's not on the Wikipedia page, certainly wasn't on the, those top ten, but I thought, I'm sure Turner must have painted a lighthouse or two in his time. So I asked it about when you turn and paint the picture that I have, which is when it started to get a little bit more interesting, I suppose, because I asked it's maybe something a little bit more obscure about Turner. But it came back with a very believable, plausible answer. It told me that it, that it had been painted in 1817. It's actually also known as the Bell Rock House, um, and told me more information about it as well. But was this actually factually correct? Well, no, it wasn't. Bell Rock Lighthouse, the painting by Turner, was actually painted in 1819, not 1817. So that was something it definitely got wrong. And actually, Bell Rock Lighthouse isn't listed as one of Turner's notable paintings anywhere. And I went through the whole list on Wikipedia, which I think had about 100, and it's certainly not um, listed as a notable painting. So where had ChatGPT got the idea that it was notable, this particular painting? And also, going on from that, how, why did ChatGPT assume I was talking about Bell Rock the Lighthouse and I said the lighthouse? There's at least four other paintings by Turner with the words the lighthouse um, in their title, um, which I could have been referring to. So maybe you know, a better answer to ChatGPT might have been to ask me you know, which, which painting I was um, talking about. Note the, the Eddystone Lighthouse was uh, actually painted in 1870. So maybe that's the cause of the confusion, that it somehow mixed up the information about the Edderstone Lighthouse with the Bell Rock Lighthouse. Maybe. But it still definitely got a few things wrong there. I then kind of went on to decide, well, okay, what about summarising text? How good is it at summarising text? Um, and I thought I'd investigate that along with giving it some information, actually, the correct information about the Beryl Rock Lighthouse painting, including the fact that it was painted in 1819, uh, and see what happened, first of all, in its summary, and then also when I started to ask it more questions. Um, the summary wasn't bad, uh, other than the fact that I, I did object to the fact that I'd asked for a three-sentence summary couldn't count to three, it gave me four sentences, but I suppose that's, you know, um, maybe unacceptable. Um, and it did apologise when I pointed it out um, that it was four sentences, not three. Um, more interestingly, when I then went on to ask it again, when did it paint the lighthouse, it was now convinced it had been painted in 1819 rather than 1817. So my information that I'd given it in the summary had kind of given it new information. And whilst its ability to learn appears to be a useful feature, the fact that it was kind of basing it on this extra information I had given it, it is also slightly worrying that it's quite easy to convince ChatGPT of some new facts, um, and it's quite then happy to sort of tell me that, you know, um, there may be, you know, appears to be a matter of some uncertainty when I was asking about well, how it knew um, apologising for the confusion, but it was painted in 1819, um, not um, 1817. So, a few things that you know were uh, certainly worrying um, there. Just before then, I go on to sort of really talking about kind of 
why it's potentially making some of these mistakes. Just want to give you one other example, just to convince you this wasn't just a one-off. I also was asking it about Rotherfield, which is the village where I live, and I was talking to it about what's, what's interesting about Rotherfield, and it was telling me, well, there's lots of Tudor buildings in Rotherfield. Ooh, well, really, are they? Which, which buildings in Rotherfield are, are the Tudor period? I asked ChatGPT. And so it went through a list, including the old post office, which I have um, illustrated here, which I think probably is a Tudor. Uh, told me about St. Dennis' Church, which is more medieval than Tudor, but yes, um, I suppose that's acceptable. It was then telling me about the Six Bells pub, and I was like, well, there's no Six Bells pub in Rotherfield. Definitely isn't. Um, so I decided to investigate, ask it more about um, the Six Bells pub. Um, by asking it where it was in uh, what, when it was convinced, it gave me an address. Well, first of all, it told me it was located on the high street, and then gave me an address, which actually wasn't the high street, it's the street, um, and a postcode that doesn't match the street or the high street in Rotherfield. So lots of information in there that's, that's just wrong, really, and not even consistent with itself. This is actually the pub in Rotherfield, which is Tudor, um, the King's Arms, uh, but this pub, the Six Bells, is in Chiddingly, about 12 miles away, um, and it's, I think it's on the street in Chiddingly, so that may be again where it, some information is mixed up, um, but it's definitely um, got this information wrong. And then when I went on to ask it, you know, well actually that postcode is North Street, um, is that where you mean? It was in, oh yes, of course that's where I mean, and updated <laughs> uh, the information it then like, gave me later on. And apologies for any confusion, no, it's, it's the Six Bowers is um, on North Street um, in Rotherfield. Um, so, so why? That, I suppose, is the, the question that we're really here to, to answer. You know, if you haven't sort of played around with ChatGPT before, uh, you know, I do you know, say, we'll go and ask it some, some questions and myself and see what it comes back with. But, but why, why would it make these kind of mistakes? And the thing that we need to understand, sort of take away from tonight, is that what large language models are designed to do is generate plausible responses. They're designed to be believable, okay? But they're not designed to be true. Um, and the idea is that, you know, they're generating text. Generation does not equal looking it up in some big source of knowledge. And it, when we're talking about things being plausible, that's not the same as them being true. They just sound like they could be true. Um, and there are ways, and we'll come on to that in the ways that ChatGPT has been trained to make it more truthful than it probably was in, in its earlier incarnations. Um, but at the, the very kind of fundamentals of how they work, that is what they are doing, is they are generating text which is designed to be believable. Um, and it's based on very large corpora, so we have to think about what the text is in that corpora that they're basing this on. Um, but they're not looking it up um, in the, the, um, the corpora, they are um, generating text which sounds like it might have come from that um, corpus. So, to understand this further, so we're going to go through some of the kind of the now the history of, of language modeling to where we are today with these um, large language models. And I'm going to start by just sort of talking about what a language model is. Um, a probabilistic language model is something which computes one of these two things, and they, you know, they're anybody. That, um, we will see that the kind of the related tasks, and the fact that we, we think about the probability of a sequence of words, um, or that related task, which is the probability of one word given um, another sequence of tasks. Sequence of tasks, sequence of words. Um, so that is what we're doing when we're thinking about a language model. We're thinking about how likely 
motivation for language modeling, modeling back in the 1990s and 2000s came out of various natural language processing tasks, including machine translation. It was seen to be you know, really important to be able to generate uh, translations that seemed fluent um, in the target language, so we'd want to be able to generate something um, that knew that um, it was more probable in English to say large winds tonight or high winds tonight. So we'd actually say high winds tonight, not large winds tonight. So we, even though they kind of mean the same thing, we wanted to generate the text that's uh, more fluent um, in the target language or in spelling correction, knowing that 50, uh, 15 minutes from York is more probable than 15 minuets from York in the language would allow a system to correct somebody's spelling based on the other words around it. Or where a lot of the work on early language modeling ha happened which is in speech recognition, the fact that if you're trying to transcribe speech, things which sound very similar phonetically, um, I saw a van and I or of an, I can barely even say that because it's so not the kind of uh, uh, sequence that we would actually um, say as a sequence of words, so improbable, um, but phonetically they're very similar, but knowing that one is a lot more likely in the language would allow a, a speech recognition system to um, correctly identify the sequence of words that was being um, said. Going on to sort of thinking about how this kind of worked in the early days, when we're thinking about this probability of a sequence of words, we're using the chain rule for probability uh, based on the definition of conditional probability. The fact that if we want to know the probability of this sequence of words from word one up to word n, we know that same as the probability of seeing word one times by the probability of seeing word two, given that we've seen word one, times by the probability of seeing word three, given that we've seen word one and word two, and so on, all the way up um, to word n. Back here around 2000, we imagined that it would be possible to estimate these probabilities <coughs> in a really large corpus. So if we wanted to know the probability of seeing the word heal, having seen the word, then he appeared over the um, we could actually count how many times these things occurred and estimate um, the probability. And people did do that with um, large corporate back um, in the kind of um, early 2000s. But language has a kind of unique sort of property, well, I think it's very unique in the sense that vocabulary um, is so large and essentially the sparsity means that these frequencies, when we're thinking about sequences of words, quickly become very, very small and unreliable. The chances of having seen you know, a certain sequence of words multiple times in a corpus is really um, low. So we need to have a way of being able to work out these probabilities without actually having to count how many times you've actually seen them in some really huge um, theoretical um, corpus. Um, so the early solution was to use Markov assumptions. Um, and so there was a lot of work um, in n-ground language modeling uh, where essentially we assume that the nth word depends only on the previous n minus one word and you can ignore everything else that has gone before then. Um, so if you've got a unigram model, that's just one <coughs> word to say that all words occur independently. Um, and therefore, um, you don't have to consider the, the previous words at all. Here, I've given the example of a bigram model, n equals 2. The probability of the current word depends only on the previous one word. Um, and so you could estimate the probability of a sequence of k words by multiplying together the probability of each word given the previous word in the sequence. And this could be extended to trigrams, that's n equals 3, quadrigrams, and so on. Um, obviously, the higher we go with n, the more the problem of data sparsity kicks in. Uh, and there are lots of unseen events and unseen combinations of events, um, which actually
actually are possible because every time people speak, every time people write, they write something probably that nobody has ever written before if you think about the whole um, sequence <coughs> of what they uh, are saying. So there was a lot of work at the time around um, smoothing these probability distributions. And um, then the other kind of problem or limitation in engram uh, modeling was the fact that vocabulary items are considered completely distinct. We couldn't share probability mass between similar words. Um, whether the word was cat or kitten or cats, you know, that didn't, the, every word was considered completely distinct and we would be thinking about the probability of that particular string given the uh, previous string. And these two limitations, I suppose, will both what kind of limit engram modeling, but also kind of give rise to the kind of solutions um, that people came up with that actually then um, have led to where we are now. One of those is what I mentioned earlier in, in distributional semantics, and I'm, I'm going to go back um, to that one now, um, which is the fact that we can consider when we're in distributional semantics words as being points in very um, high dimensional spaces. Um, and here I've just got two dimensions on my um, very uh, small semantic space here. But the idea is that um, you, as I was saying earlier, we're scoring words based on how they, um, the context that they occur with. So I've got two possible dimensions here that a word could occur with a word in the context of poisonous, or it can occur in the context of green. And every word is placed in the space based on how it occurs in these contexts, usually based in somewhere on frequency. Um, and essentially, within that space, you can then decide that, well, snake has occurred, you can see it's occurred a lot of points, and with green, and it seems to be more similar, um, say, to berry than it is to, to mushroom or grass. Um, and this is a way into kind of thinking about how we might start to kind of share kind of information between different words when we're starting to, to make these models. The fact that similar words could be used to, to help us estimate the probabilities um, within our language models. The point I made here about the number of dimensions might be greater or equal to the size of the vocabulary. Here I'm imagining, first of all, that you might have every possible word in the vocabulary as a context. But then you also might have um, phrases as your context. You could be thinking in terms of um, left context, right context. So typically, the number of dimensions in these kind of spaces is absolutely huge, um, much larger um, than the size um, of the vocabulary. So that, certainly in the early days, was, a, again, a problem um, that um, we needed to consider how can we kind of work in these really large spaces or how can we actually make maybe the dimensionality um, smaller. Um, which is where kind of neural networks kind of came in. Um, the idea in sort of neural network language models is that we're going to use a neural network to model the language. So we've still got the same goals, the same aims in terms of being able to predict uh, what word might come next or what the probability of a um, sequence of words is. Um, but we're going to use a neural network. We're going to train it on um, a very large um, corpora to estimate the probabilities of word sequences. Um, so in terms of you know, people first starting um, uh, to do this, um, essentially what we've got is um, started around 2003. So we go from kind of very quickly having sort of, you know, this diagram where I've got kind of a single neural unit, where we've got kind of some inputs, which could be words, or they could be features of the words. We've got our weights, and we're thinking that they're going to be <coughs> summed together, and then put through an activation um, function to give us um, an output. Um, we suddenly, we, we sort of move to kind of having a kind of neural network where we've just got Potentially thousands of these neural uh, units that are kind of connected together 
to be able to kind of make predictions about language. And this is what you know, people were doing back in 2003, so nothing really that new I'm here. Um, but it's kind of where it all started. Um, so in this example here, we've got some text, um, hole in the ground there lived, and the idea is that the neural network is trying to predict the next word based on a um, context window in front of the, the word. And so here the example has got a three word um, context uh, window, so it's a bit like a, a, a four gram, a quarter gram um, uh, language model, and it's going to try to predict based on the ground there what the next word um, was in the, in the sequence. Essentially, within the neural network, we first got an input layer, um, which we have a, a, a one point coding, which essentially is uh, we've got indexes of words, essentially. So it's saying that we've got uh, which is the actual word um, that has happened, that's occurred, and then that gets um, projected um, via the um, the embedding weights. And that's where this information um, is, becomes stored about the kind of meanings of words. So each one of these, um, first of the one block vectors, um, is projected into the, the representation of the word, which is typically um, the, the number of dimensions per word is usually around, or was at the time, certainly around, say, 300. So we have these um, three times um, 300 um, units in the projection layer, then we've got the hidden layer, and then an output layer which is trying to make a prediction about um, the word. And essentially what we've got here is it's going to have a produces a probability distribution across the vocabulary, and we will train this by looking at what word actually occurred, what did the model say was the probability of that word, and computing a loss function, which would then allow all of those weights within that network, and we could kind of try and work out how many thousands of weights and parameters there are in there, but we can certainly see that there are a lot, um, to update all of those weights so that the next time it would potentially make a better prediction. And the idea is if you do that over your very large um, corpus, uh, looking at every single word and trying to predict it based on, in this case, the previous three words, and learn weights, weights that will represent the, the meanings of these words, and then in the, the hidden layer and the output layer, how you then predict what the next um, word should be. And that was probably, in some ways, I suppose it's <coughs> certainly the, the first kind of new um, language model, and is the, the kind of, I suppose, the very kind of forefather of the kind of large language models um, that we um, see today. Been a lot of kind of improvements um, since then, which I will come to. Um, first, I just wanted to mention a little bit more about these things called the word embeddings, um, which are what we find essentially living in this kind of layer here, uh, which is called the embedding layer, um, which are the weights um, that go that project from the kind of one hot um, layer, which just encodes the input um, into the kind of projection layer. These, again, in the same way that we saw in the distribution of semantics from the kind of uh, earlier work, place words as points in a high dimensional space. Um, typically, as I said, the number of dimensions is around 300. So it's much smaller than in the kind of distribution of semantics um, work that we're sort of looking at kind of a uh, very even higher number of dimensions. Um, but essentially, they're capturing the same thing. They're capturing word similarities between words based on how they are used, how they occur in the same context as other words. These embeddings are randomly initialized and they get updated, um, as I said, during the training um, of the neural network. Uh, which does then kind of, and we will kind of think about this uh, <coughs> in the next few slides, um, about some of the limitations in kind of the, we see in, in those kind of word embeddings. 
just to sort of talk through about, mention some of the other kind of developments that sort of happened kind of along the way between sort of 2003 and 2023. Probably a kind of pivotal kind of moment um, time was around 2013 uh, when Thomas Mikhailov, the Google at the time, um, started um, releasing a lot of work kind of on this, these ideas of the, these word embeddings and was using the current view on network language models to produce these word embeddings. And the advantage here is that you don't need to have a fixed um, context window. Essentially, the current view on network uh, maintains um, a history of the sentence. You just have an input, which is the current word. You still have the word representations or embeddings, which are essentially stored in that weight matrix. Um, and then you have a, your hidden layer, which you can consider the new word that's the input, along with this kind of memory of the um, sentence that it's seen um, so far. That gets then remembered for the next time step, and also used to produce a prediction um, for what the next um, word um, is. Um, and so, again, the current neural networks have become kind of very popular uh, within kind of language modeling um, since around that time. And the other thing also that sort of Thomas Mikhailov did at the same year um, was um, to, um, invent, I suppose the word is, or release uh, Wordtabec, which was a tool um, which became very popular uh, in kind of natural language processing word world uh, called Wordtabec, um, which again was used to kind of create these embeddings, these representations of words uh, where they were um, made by either, in the <coughs> case, trying to predict the current word given the context. You take your current representations of the context words, you add them up and try to predict what the, the current word was, and then you would um, update all of your weights based on the, the loss function between what you were predicting <coughs> and what was actually in the corpus, um, or the alternative um, kind of mirror image idea of predicting the context <coughs> um, given um, the current word. And this became a very, very popular way of kind of representing words um, and um, word um, meaning. But it does have some limitations, um, which were the fact that those kind of word embeddings tend to conflate all different senses of a word. Um, most words have multiple meanings. Uh, I've given them one example here, star, but a, a, an embedding of that word is to try to kind of um, cover all of those kind of meanings. We also don't ever know, you know, if you've got words which appear to be similar because they're used in similar ways, do they really mean the same thing or maybe they are antonyms, opposites, like hot and cold, um, or other words which may be similar but don't actually mean the same thing. So, you know, cats and dogs and animals, they're all kind of members of the same class, but they're not actually, don't mean the same thing. Or even we may have words that are just topically unrelated, can be similar. So again, it just depends a little bit how you want to kind of use your word in base. Other interesting problems, ones that we were looking at at Sussex at the time was how do you kind of put these representations together to um, create representations of large units of meanings, such as sentences? And the problems, well, not problems, but certainly questions around how to, could you interpret the dimensions in this space and how are rare words represented? Because, as I said earlier, they tend to be, well, they not tend to be, they are initialized randomly. And so if you initialize randomly, um, your representation of a word, and you didn't really see it very often in your um, corpus, then its representation will be quite random. And it also does mean that every time you run something like uh, Word of it, um, you will get a different representation of your words, and you'll get different um, results um, from it. Okay. Um, yeah. Moving on. Um, because the next big thing was the kind of um, arrival of encoder-decoder networks, which was around kind of 2016 um, in uh, natural language processing, certainly when they started to kind of get popular. And this was the idea of using a recurrent neural 
neural network to encode a whole sequence into some point in latent space um, and then use another recurrent neural network to decode that into another sequence. And that's where the kind of idea almost of generation, I suppose, of, of text um, kind of really kind of, I suppose, took off. The fact that we could give it one sequence, we could encode that sequence and then ask it to generate a new sequence for us. And this really came out of work um, in machine translation. You can imagine we have uh, English text here and we're asking it to translate into maybe the, the French or German um, equivalent. Um, and if you train it with enough um, pairs of sequences where one is a translation of the other, this encoded decoder network will learn to generate plausible <laughs> translations of our um, input text. And as this was a kind of, I suppose, the deep learning era, these encoded and decoder networks typically got stacked uh, quite large, so you tend to have stacks of encoders um, and then stacks of decoders to be able to kind of produce um, better um, translations. <coughs> from there, moved on to the, and this kind of comes from the encoder decoder, uh, especially the idea of the encoder. And this is quite a kind of was a big pivotal kind of move again in, in natural language processing was going from a word embedding, which captured was supposed to capture the meaning, whole meaning of a word this idea of contextualised word embedding, which kind of came out of work by Peter Zetau with Elmo in 2018 and also Bert, which was 2018 slash 2019 in terms of when um, that was also released, which I'm going to come to um, shortly, was this idea that these RNAs could be used to build a representation of a word in its context. But if we put the star appeared, something, something, carpet, and here I've got the idea that we've got a celebrity type star appearing on the red carpet. Um, if we put it through an RNA and say, um, look at the output um, at, the, at this point here where we've got the star, it will have a representation um, of star but in the context of the, the history of the sentence before it. And we can do that, and what uh, Peter and Al uh, proposed was to look, um, use a forward RNA to um, have uh, the context of the um, word, um, the left context of the word, and then the backward RNA, which could look at, could go the other way through the sequence, and could therefore represent the right context of the word. And so you could then get a representation of a word that was essentially its meaning, but its meaning in the context of the sentence which it was appearing. Um, and this kind of starts to sort of overcome the kind of problems potentially to with kind of word sense ambiguity. At the same time, think of us as we're moving a pace in the kind of machine learning world. And generally, and people were moving away from kind of RNNs to transformers. And I'm not going to go into the kind of depths of kind of how transformers uh, work, but essentially we've got an encoded decoder network. Uh, and rather than an RNN, we've got this thing called a multi head attention uh, unit in there. And these tend to again get stacked. This says n times because we can have as many of these as we feel able to kind of fix um, together. We've got the processing power, the GPUs, to, the TPUs to be able to kind of um, train these things. Um, and the point with, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, attention, uh, but the point with this was over the RNA, they, they seem to powerize better, be faster, and to scale better. So from a kind of engineering perspective, they kind of seem to work um, much better. What is attention doing? At a very high level, essentially it's looking at how the representation of one word um, should be affected by the representations of all the other words in the sentence. So it's this same idea as, that we were sort of talking about a moment ago about contextual. 
socialization, um, but we, uh, it's using um, this thing called uh, attention head um, to be able to build a representation of uh, the word from the representations of um, all the other words in the sentence. So it's essentially contextualizing it. These things are called multi-head attention because actually we tend to have 12 attention heads, which is quite typical, um, in every layer so that every word can pay attention to, to multiple different things um, at the same time. Um, so again, these things get very large in terms of um, the, the number of parameters that we're, we're talking about here. So, almost there. Um, kind of, I suppose, the first, what I would say, pre-trained large language model to really appear um, was BERT, which appeared um, in 2019. And this was the bi-directional encoder representations from transformers. They obviously thought a long time about how to get an acronym like BERT to be a Sesame Street character that was popular at the time in terms of, I don't know, appeared the year before and BERT um, in 2019 and to fit in the, um, the bidirectional and coded representations from transformers in as an acronym there. Essentially, this was just using the encoder portion. It was just thinking about how do we um, encode a sentence and how do we represent um, the words um, and we're using left and right context at the same time to build um, a representation of a target word. Pre-trained on general language modeling tasks, specifically this thing called the masked language modeling task and uh, next sentence prediction. It can also be fine-tuned on task-specific uh, training days. But what we're really thinking about here is those pre-training tasks because we're thinking about pre-trained um, generative large language models. So what are they trained to do or what is BERT trained to do what they're all trained to do in, in some way or other is either mass language modeling or um, next word prediction in the case of um, some of the other uh, language models. But Bert was trained to do mass language modeling, which is this idea that if we've got a sentence, we cover up some of the words and ask it to predict what words should go there. And if it's got good <coughs> representations of the words and good representations of how they interact together to to, to make the sentence, it should be able to uh, predict which words um, go um, in the kind of the gaps. And that's essentially um, the kind of main um, thing that our language models do <coughs> when they are kind of learning language is to predict what words um, fill in um, the blanks. They're also trained to do, or some of them are, but certainly was, I think this has been uh, drops in some of the later large language models. Um, next sentence prediction, which is whether one sentence is likely um, to follow another um, in a coherent text. Um, so, what are pre trained large language models? They are language models which have been, as we said, pre trained on very large corpora. I said at the beginning, um, BNC seemed very large back in. Um, 2000, BERT was pre-trained on Wikipedia, which is 2.5 billion words, and the Google Book Corpus at 800 million words, so much, much larger than what we were working with in 2000. And it <coughs> took, in the paper it says, four days and a four by four TPU slice um, to train BERT base, which is the smallest of these models, uh, which I worked out would cost around, if we were using current cloud computing, around $5,000. Um, to do um, that training, and that's one of the, the smaller ones um, of these models. Um, strengths and limitations, it's really good at the task it's been trained to do, which is filling in blanks with plausible suggestions, and in Bert's case, identifying whether two sentences are likely um, to follow on from each other. Beyond Bert, there are variations, a lot of them have got Bert in the name, <laughs> um, and there are other pre-trained large language models such as the very kind of famous GPT family um, and um, Meta's uh, Llama is one of the more recent <coughs> ones, we've got Google's Bard uh, and lots of other kind of large language models which kind of 
work on very, very similar um, principles. The one that we're kind of specifically talking about today, um, are the kind of GPT um, family. So GPT-3 first appeared really back in 2020. Difference with BERT is that actually it was auto-regressive, so it was trained to predict the next token rather than mass tokens, but it's still being used to predict tokens, that's how it was pre-trained. This means it can have a variable length input, uh, but it's unidirectional in nature, so it doesn't look at the kind of, the, the, not have any knowledge of the kind of following text, which makes it very good for generation, if we think that we want to be able to kind of um, have text and know what's going to come uh, next. At the time, um, GPT-3 was the um, 10 times bigger than any of its competitors, um, 175 billion parameters, so it's, uh, I think, about BERT base. There was then BERT large, which was twice as large as that, and BERT, I think, was larger than BERT uh, large by, again, another factor of two or four, and then we had GPT-3, um, 10 times um, larger. And it was also trained on a lot more text. Uh, Wikipedia, Books 1, Books 2, Web Text 2, and this thing with common cool corpus. This means, and we have to kind of remember that when we think about how it's generating responses. What is it doing? It's taking a prompt and it's using a language model to try to predict what could come next. You know, when I say, when did you turn the picture of the lighthouse? You know, we can turn it into, well, we could just use that as a prompt itself, see what it would predict as next, or possibly we could uh, convert it into a sentence with a gap in it and see what would get uh, predicted there. But what it's going to try and do is find words that fill in the blanks with the highest probability according to its large language model. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, we've got to remember that large language models Trained on fiction as well as fact. We saw all those books corpus, corpus that have gone in um, to their training. You know, answers can be plausible without being truthful. You know, quite often the truth is maybe even less plausible than the the, um, the fiction. Um, and what we do see is that large language models are really prone um, to this thing called hallucination. They add in words and sometimes even whole sentences that just seem to have a high probability given the context. The fact that Chat GB told me that the lighthouse was one of Turner's notable maritime works was just because that seemed right. You know, it was talking about turns, talking about maritime works. It was seen, you know, it seems the kind of text you would expect to find in a kind of review maybe of paintings um, to say that it was a notable um, maritime work. So, does ChatGPT do anything more than what we've kind of seen with the language modeling? Well, it does. If you go to their website, it says that they use instruct GPT models, where they've, they've been trained with humans in the leap to be more truthful and less toxic. Um, they use this alignment technique um, called reinforcement learning from human feedback, which basically means that customers submit their prompts to uh, the API, they then have human labelers who provide demonstrations of the desired model behavior, which they then use to find tune GT3, um, which they uh, essentially are saying, that this is the prompt, this is the kind of answer that you should be providing, and then seeing what GPT3 provides and updating its parameters accordingly. They then have a uh, the next part is to get the human labelers to rank different model outputs. They get ChatGPT to output various different outputs, and then they have the humans, say, rank them in terms of acceptability, which they then use to train this thing called a reward model, which can then predict which output labelers would prefer. So this will allow them to kind of decide which possible output is the the most acceptable without actually asking humans to, to rank them by having trained a model that can replicate the human labelers. And this is then actually used to train this additional input that they use, which is known as the policy, um, using uh, proximal policy optimization. But essentially, this is training it to be able to kind of um, produce the output that is going to be most acceptable so to maximise um, the reward according to this model which is modelling the, the human's uh, idea of um, acceptability. Does it 
it work? Well, according to open AI, they're very positive that it does work. Um, and we can see that, you know, compared to just the GPT kind of basic kind of model um, from, from academic use, um, it does seem to kind of reduce the toxicity. Well, a little bit anyway. I mean, it's still definitely some way to go in terms of the fact that there is still obviously toxic um, output <coughs> being produced. Same with the truthfulness. Yes, it does seem to be a lot more truthful than GPT, but 0.413 doesn't suggest to me that it's, you know, there seems to be a lot of the scale, you know, again, where it could be a lot higher in terms of its truthfulness <coughs> on those openness. Similarly, the hallucinations, they're reduced with their um, fine tuning, but again, we can see that there are obviously still hallucinations um, in there. So, weaknesses. We've got to remember it doesn't know or understand anything. It doesn't look, for example, carry out any kind of inferences. And words which mean similar things <coughs> for it are easy for it to mix up, especially numbers and dates, because they would have very similar representations in the language model. Um, and, you know, things that we should remember, it's been trained on a really large corpus, which is probably biased in itself, certainly towards certain time periods, certain geographic locations, cultures or ways of thinking. And that fine-tuning process of asking humans to label things, certainly you know, if we were a conspiracy theorist, we might imagine we're kind of uh, getting, going to be subverted by um, people with less good intentions um, than ourselves. So certainly you know, we should always question uh, what ChatGPT um, tells us and certainly check. Um, that it's got its um, facts right. I know I'm short of time, so I am very much coming um, to the end now. Um, just to say, ongoing research that we are kind of carrying out here at Physics is, is looking into these things. We're trying to look at the characteristics of facts or non facts, which make them more likely to be verified or disputed by a large language model. You know, how that's affected by asking it to base its answer on provided text. <coughs> Yeah, so the information is more likely to generate incorrectly uh, by the large language model and also whether the diversity in the responses generated by the large language model, um, the fact that sometimes it, you know, if you ask the same questions multiple times in slightly different ways, it might give you very different answers, can that allow us to assess um, the kind of veracity of what's um, being produced? Um, very, very quickly, um, initial results looking at this uh, Czech COVID uh, data set uh, suggests to us that um, it does, when we're asking it whether a document provides enough information to support or refute a kind of COVID related claim, um, it does pretty well actually when the document does support or refute um, the uh, claim. Um, although not perfectly, so you know, again, it's not perfectly trustworthy. Actually, what it's worth that is when there isn't really enough information in the document, um, and it doesn't realise that it just tells you what it thinks in terms of whether um, it's true um, or false. The future. Well, I asked ChatGPT what the future looked like. <laughs> and I don't think ChatGPT really knew. It gave you a very vague, uh, willy answer. Um, telling you that it was inherently uncertain um, and that maybe I should be more specific uh, I, I, if I've got a more specific question it would be happy to, to help me so I asked it how will people use large language models in the future it came up with lots of ideas about that it's very good at generating lists it's chatting with you um, and some of those I think they probably will be ways people use them I think whether people should use them for all of these things. I, they, they worry me, so many of these, and I kind of organise them into a kind of chart on the, the next slide in terms of what I think, I mean, in terms of whether we should be using these things or, um, for uh, catchy boutique for these things or not. Um, so I'm just going to skip to that one because it's probably easier to read. Um, so some of the things which I think are probably okay are around kind of language translation, Creative writing, yeah, if you want to use ChatGPT to help you um, write a story, um, why not? Um, 
you know, in gaming, virtual worlds, um, um, making things more accessible, maybe generating some um, uh, speech from the, the kind of text or things like that. They are ways I think which will um, people will use and um, fairly successfully. Things which I think are probably definitely not okay. Uh, using them in public policy and governance to kind of make decisions or to decide policy as I would I would be quite scared to live in a world uh, where ChatGPT was deciding public policy or, or, or offering mental health advice and therapy, I think that one's quite scary as well personally um, I think content generation is probably a bad idea along with news and journalism unless I suppose in the content generation it is supposed to be very creative um, <coughs> and yeah, in the middle, how we might use it in kind of research and education, there are probably some good, good use cases and some um, more dubious um, use cases um, there. Okay, I will finish there and just say, are there any questions?
So it would pick one of the words, it, and, and, and any time it was created, so if you were actually using one of these to generate, it would um, basically just sample a word from the vocabulary according to the kind of probability distribution that it's got. So occasionally it would pick something which you know, has a very, very low probability, but most of the time it's going to pick a word that it thinks is highly probable. Not always the most probable, because uh, as we see, that would not lead to creativity if it always picked the most probable word. It's going to sample these words according to their, their probability, and therefore uh, that allows it to kind of um, give different words or, or different kinds, which means that, yeah, again, every time you kind of use it, you will actually get a different answer because it's yeah. actually um, using kind of randomness to, to generate, but according to the probability distribution. Yourself, and then you, so you first. Um, so you mentioned a few times about the huge sample base, the corporate that is yeah. training on yeah. the first ones to train on. And then at the end, you said that probably one of the other uses is chatbots and virtual assistants, which is a similar use case yeah. to another one you mentioned a lot about companies yeah. searching their own knowledge yeah. bases, which is a small one. Does that exacerbate the problem? Is that, is that a realistic thing to use for? I think it depends how you use it, which I think was why I had it in my maybe column. Um, so I think the kind of use case that you would see probably for all of these is they're going to be, they're always going to start to pre-train on the really, really large corporate, which gives them a kind of basic knowledge of language. And then what you do is you kind of, the different things that you can do, you can either kind of give it your particular corpus as kind of additional training, just to kind of specialise it in uh, the kind of language that you're interested in, um, or you can uh, kind of fine tune it in some way. So if you've got a corpus which says, actually, if this is the question I wanted to give this kind of answer, which is what you might imagine in a chatbot, uh, it will that will be used to kind of fine tune it to kind of provide the kind of answers. Um, that, that you want, but it still had the um, benefit of being pre-trained on the really um, large corporate, um, which means it kind of has a better, I don't actually use the word understanding, but yeah, a better understanding of the words that um, are occurring, because it has better representations of them. Yeah. 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 And then you I was curious about, uh, and like from, from what I understood, uh, like there are some language models that uh, uh, kind of uh, they are trained by hiding some words yeah. and phrases and letting them yeah. guess them. And GPT, which uh, tries always to get the next yeah. word, is there uh, and. Like I can't really imagine other possible ways of training language models to to use different kind of sequencing in the words. Is there any relationship um, between the truthfulness and uh, the 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 kind of words that get hidden in the phrase when people train them? Because I can see why does a lot of hallucinations because it chooses the next word. Yeah. Is there any, any body of work on, on uh, choosing how to hide words in the training? It's, a, it's an interesting question. I think, in, in general, um, I think probably not really. Most of the time it's, it's just done randomly. You, know, you, you choose randomly to, and the idea is that you know, um, over such a large corpus, and you potentially train over that you know, multiple times, hiding different words um, each time you go through the corpus. Um, it's essentially, that's meant to sort of, I suppose, cover all, all possibilities in terms of the, the words that you could cover up. Um, and um, similarly, in sort of choosing that they're having to predict the next word, um, again, yeah, no, so I, I'm not, yeah. Notice that uh, Chat GPT gets trained uh, on the next yeah. word, and it's not surprising that it creates uh, hallucinations. Yes, yeah, because it then kind of 
fuels itself almost in terms of when it starts saying something, it then yes, uses so that to predict what's to come next so it can kind of yeah, go off on a complete... It will say something yeah. that makes sense, yeah. uh, yeah. but it doesn't feel like uh, mm. it will say something necessarily true. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Well, thank you. Yourself, yourself, and then... Yeah. Okay, yeah. Right, my question was, I'll preface this of saying, just finished university, so I kind of had an experience of using ChatGPT for like school work, university work. And one thing I realized is ChatGPT is very bad at giving you like a source, like you demonstrated before. If you ask it like, where did you get this from? It's not very good at explaining that. And that's for the reasons you've said, because it's always trying to predict the next word. It's just trying to predict, and even sometimes when you get things with references in from ChatGPT, they do seem to just be kind of completely yeah. kind of ending up there. <laughs> Um, which I have found a few times checking essays that I'm, I'm marking going, I've never heard of that reference. <laughs> and then you kind of like look it up and go, oh, it really doesn't exist. So, and of course I don't know that the students use ChatGPT to, to write their, their essay, but you know, it strikes me as more and more of a possibility. Yeah, so yeah, yes. so yeah. on that I was going to ask, I feel like that might just be, I can be optimistic and say that's a bit of a bad thing that's happening now because of these generative AIs are quite new. Yeah. So I was thinking, let's say we get to a point maybe in 10 years mm -hmm. when it's kind of scrubbed with these teething issues about not really knowing where to get sources from, we can fix that. For making these weird hallucinations, let's say we get it down to like less than 1%. Yeah. Do we think then we could say we can trust AI, like the gentleman asked over there, for a more corporate use yeah. for action? Well, this, that list I think was very good. Yeah. Like, let's not use it to do, you know, work in, in actually important things like yeah. schools and government and companies, but I just feel like there is people that aren't as well, have as much foresight and understanding of how it works, there's a big push to like use it now, yeah. now, now, let's do it in big, big things in society. What, What's your opinion on will that situation ever come around? I think, yeah, I mean, I think it will get better, won't it, and it will get even more believable to the point where, you know, maybe it is, you know, truthful 99% of the time. Uh, I think... We've still got to, you know, be careful. We've got to remember that it's, you know, there's no kind of moral compass, you know, in, a, in an AI, uh, and you know, the, the motives are going to reflect potentially the people who have trained it, people that, are, you know. So I think, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd still be wary of using it in kind of, you know, to make policies and, and to make decisions that are kind of. Uh, I think we can use it to assist us in those. Um, decisions if we can trust what it's telling us. Uh, but I think we still, we always have to realise that a person needs to take responsibility for it. So rather than saying what well, the AI said, you know, we need to say, well, I think this, and maybe, yes, my friend, the AI, kind of helped me find the information that helped me form my kind of opinion, but it should still be kind of a person's decision at the end of the day that's, you know, like an important one. Maybe not if it's in a kind of game or something like that. You know, that that's different. But you know, in, in real life. So what's the space? That's one of the next questions. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Very, new, very new to this subject. Um, where, who controls the website? I presume it's the website. Mm. <coughs> where is all this work taking place, and who is overseeing the? Well, the so work? so I mean, ChatGPT is a company called OpenAI, which is actually quite funny in the fact that they're not actually that. Big. <laughs> um, but it's open AI and um, so yeah, they're a big corporation and then the other ones, I mean Google have Bard, um, Meta have Llama, so it's, yeah, Meta <coughs> was Facebook. So it's largely large tech companies um, such as Google and Facebook, Meta, um, that have produced these because they're the ones that have the kind of the computing power to be able to train these models. Yeah, that's what kind of <coughs> governs who can kind of actually um, control them. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a large tech company. Uh, large American? Largely American, yes. Yeah. And there's no overseeing body or anything like that? Um, not really, no. I mean, there are, there's, there's kind of a lot of conversations around regulations and things yeah, yeah, that need to come it's in it's and things like that. Yeah, embryonic. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Did you have a response to a question earlier? Yeah, I saw you raise your hand. No? Okay. Great. And then Dan? Sure. Um, and then you? Uh, 
are some languages more successful than others for LLMs, for instance, how does it handle Chinese, and how well are the Chinese doing in this field? Okay, so there are kind of language models, I think now, pretty much all, all languages. Um, they, a lot of the work, you know, early work certainly was all in English, um, and I suppose work in English kind of, <coughs> and the kind of English language models have generally been trained on maybe more text. Um, and obviously, if you've got a language where there isn't much text out there, it's hard to train language model. But things like Chinese, there are a lot of there's a lot of Chinese language out there um, to, to train as well. I think there's possible there are adaptations that need to be made, certainly in the way that you kind of tokenize the text and things like that to be able to put into them. But the kind of Chinese ones, you know, um, sort of kind of Chinese speaking colleagues that I have, you know, seem to work uh, kind of as well as well. But a lot of Chinese words. Intonation is everything. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but from the kind of, I suppose, from the, the as a as a written text. Yeah. You know, so in the same way that a, a person would read um, the, the text. But yeah, I know. I mean, we've got um, uh, people working on Arabic um, at the moment, and again, that has kind of similar kind of um, issues in terms of the kind of diacritics and things like that, and how it's represented as a written language. So there are kind of complications with other languages, um, but yeah, there's certainly quite a lot of work on, on those as well. Okay, we got Dan, yourself, and then yourself. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Julie. Um, they say with data, you get out what you put in, mm. right, the quality of it. Yeah. And I guess with the LLMs, there's a huge amount of data underpinning it. Yeah. But a lot of the art, the quality of the answer comes from the data that's put in by the user. Yeah. And I've heard this phrase, prompt engineering, yeah. quite a lot. Now, um, that's pretty good, the way that you can tailor your question and craft it to get a, spe you know, a specific kind of bias on the output. Mm. Is there any standardization in that space? Because a lot of the different models mm. are trained, I guess, on different corpus. Yeah. Um, so a standard model of how the prompt works is not going to be the, it's not going to be effective across all of them, is it? It's going to be different outcomes each no. time. and it's kind of one of those things that you kind of need to know what your answer is, the answer that you want to kind of as a user, be able to engineer your prompts um, correctly. Now, yeah, there is a lot of work where people kind of for, to work out well, how best to ask it to, to summarise something and what kind of words should you use if you've got a piece of text and you want it to, to summarise it in a certain way, or what's the best kind of language you should use to, to tell it to do that and how you should do that. But, yeah, there are kind of, I suppose, suggestions that kind of get made. Um, for certain tasks, well, it's better if you kind of ask it like this rather than you ask it like that. But I think personally, the fact that there's so much variety, in fact, if you tweak how you ask it slightly, it's going to make a big difference to the answer it gives you. That kind of just reinforces my kind of worry so that... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Sorry, yes. Um, your, uh, your remark that chat GPT tends to make up its references sometimes <laughs> reminded me of something which I think is, relevant, is in the end relevant, what I'm going to say, that one of the <coughs> um, important papers on radar reflections from the sea, which is still important in the, theory, in the area, and was written in the 1970s, long before all these things happened. One of its key, what ought to be one of its key references, does not exist. So people, the human beings back in the 1960s and 70s, I won't say they made up references, but somehow a reference got into the paper which just does not exist. So maybe the question is not whether, you know, possibly looking forward, is not whether GPT, chat GPT is infallible, but whether it's significantly worse than human beings are. Yeah, and I think that's and a good I don't point. mean PhD students. Either. Humans make mistakes <laughs> yes, as well, yes, and, yes. I think, and I think that that's a, it's a good point, that we, we maybe that, yeah, chat yeah. GPT won't make as many mistakes as, as a human, maybe, in answering mm. certain questions. I think maybe the, the, the issue really is around the fact that when we ask computer a question, we kind of expect it to get it right, whereas if we asked a bloke in the pub a question, again, we wouldn't necessarily attach quite so much sort of trust um, to that. I think it's interesting, you mentioned the human label as well. Yeah. 
for that. Did you have a question? Um, yeah, I'm just wondering if there is much thought in the academia and education, whether there's uh, about the impact it's going to have in the coming <coughs> decade, I guess, um, and whether there's any uh, drive in education to educate people, I suppose, in uh, how this is going to impact them and how to uh, navigate through all the information, or should I say disinformation that already is out there, mm. that's already difficult, but this <coughs> is going to end much worse. misleading, mistruthful propaganda um, mm -hmm. that this goes on. Yeah. It's just going to drown out the truth in some ways. Yeah, and we need, we need, we need that education and we need, uh, and you know, the thoughts thought that, you know, we, we can have these AIs that are kind of generating all this stuff, other AIs that are kind of reading it and then kind of regurgitating it in, in different kind of ways. Um, yes, you know, disinformation, either deliberate um, or misinformation, yeah, will be um, a lot easier um, I think there is a lot of talk um, in different academic circles about that. There's certainly talk around kind of educating or, or, or working out how we sort of deal with it from a kind of education and teaching and assessment kind of point of view and then also the kind of questions around how we deal with it, um, I suppose, more generally as a society. Um, but, yeah, I don't think anybody's got, got the answers yet. So that's why we're having these kind of conversations now. We'll try and finish around at 8.30, so we've got... Two more questions, one, two, and possibly one there, three. Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my qu question is, and I'll tell you why, my question is, are any of these AI systems, language systems, whatever, capable of learning from their mistakes? Uh, the, the reason why, I, I have a, a nephew who actually uh, works in Switzerland for Google, uh, presumably, and uh, he, he actually had a long discussion with him, and he pointed out some of the, okay, it was an early version of chat GPT, and I believe it's got better, but he pointed out some of the things that went wrong with them, and one of the things, he first of all said, they, these systems learn from a big database, but there isn't, nonetheless, the big database is sparse, in terms of what needs to be done. And so some of these systems are using AI to generate data to actually teach the system. So it's a sort of self-fulfilling loop on, on that. So can you trust that is the first, yes. first uh, uh, part of it. The second thing was that he said that if you, that if you engaged is in a uh, uh, session, with chat GPT and, it, and then you terminated it, um, maybe because it was unsatisfactory, the next time you went on and tried to refer to the original s session discussion and the data and uh, what, what happened to that, the chat GPT did not have any knowledge of that first session, it didn't completely delete it. So the question is, can these systems actually learn from the mistakes which are pointed out by the customers? They, they can out? do. It's not completely switch transparent how they actually use that, and they certainly do. And they certainly have. You know, you do have. You can press regenerate. That's kind of a quite a clear um, signal to them that you didn't really like the, the first response you're given. You can give thumbs up and thumbs down and things. So they are collecting all of that data from their customers. So every time you use ChatGPT or anyone uses ChatGPT, they are collecting that data. How they are actually using that, and then whether they are actually kind of verifying, because again, you can imagine people kind of um, think, aha, we'll mess up ChatGPT because we're barred and we want to make ChatGPT tell lies so they could be using it, you know, all these kind of things which um, you imagine people might do. So, whether the, how you know whether they're actually using that, they, they certainly can, and the system certainly could. If it was then given that data and told, well, this was a bad response, this was a good response, it could easily be used in the in the fine tuning process. But whether it is is, is another question. Um, so yes. We're trying to um, speed up with ten short questions. One, two. I'll give you time. Then fairly short. As a professor, you presume you meet other professors, including professors of English language. Yes. Yeah. Do they get excited about this? And if so, what do they get most excited about? 
I do know some professors of English language. Um, do they get the gigs? <laughs> but I don't think they get particularly excited about this. I mean, they, they, they certainly, they're, they're more interested, I think, the ones that I know in sort of understanding the language and how a language works and how computational tools can maybe help you to do that um, rather than necessarily these kind of applications which are just kind of producing or generating kind of language. Um, what, what's this space for people? Yeah. Is it Henry? Yeah. That for me? Yep. Yeah. Um, you uh, mentioned about computing power, and I wondered if there was any good source of um, information or data around the environmental impact of this. There is some data around that, um, and yes, I can't remember what the figures were. Somebody told me quite recently. Um, it's, it's quite large in terms of the fact that these kind of AR models are kind of you know equivalent now to kind of like you know a small country in terms of the amount of carbon emissions that these tech companies are kind of generating. Um, by training these models and deploying these models. So yes, it's definitely another concern um, and something which you know, we, we need to look at is how to potentially, if we want to use them, how to make them more environmentally um, sustainable. Good. Last question to the chairman of the Sussex Centre. It's, prob <laughs> <laughs> it's probably not as bad as Bitcoin, is it? But anyway, <laughs> that wasn't my question. Um, yeah, what about plagiarism? Um, where I believe it's very hard to detect if open AI or any kind of LLM is being used um, unless it's literally a copy and paste. What are you seeing in that area to improve the detection of those kind of things? Are, are AI models being used against each other? To try yeah, I mean that's certainly, certainly one thing. You, you train a model to kind of decide whether something's been generated by showing it lots of examples of things which have been generated. Um, I think it, it should be possible. I mean, it is really hard to sort of um, establish plagiarism anyway. But you know, I, I know, and you know, from my, my experience, certainly you know, this summer of marking so many essays and dissertations where I was just going, well, that's clearly ChatGPT, that's ChatGPT, that's ChatGPT. And there's just a way in which you, you the, the style is quite, quite clear, and it's not just the style, it's the kind of level of. You know, vagueness and some of the answers and the lists it gives you and the kind of way they're not necessarily it's quite it's coherent. But then maybe that's students as well. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd say if they're just copying and pasting lists and they're not they don't break it with their content yeah. 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 To work on that. Yeah. I, I think we should draw this to a close. Thank you so much and I'm sure you'll be here right for the next five yeah. ten minutes yeah, be, yeah. to ask some more questions yeah. to come down here. I'd like to just take this opportunity to Give this certificate signed by Dan <laughs> in, rec in recognition of what you've done. Yeah, I'm so sorry, we still say doctor here. We have to change the professor. Right. Right. And That's a little present from the IET, a power bank, would you believe yeah. it? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>